clan. Let's go in. Okay, I should see that now, right? Oh, here comes somebody. Turn the mask back up. Morning. Morning. How you doing? We can see it now. Oh, good. Or at least I can. Okay. Okay. Hope you can still see that. I guess. Done. Okay. And uh, if I advance the slides, you guys see the advanced slides? Yeah, there is. Yes. Yeah. We're going to see the presenter mode, so we see your future slides as well. But it's fine. It's not a tragedy. Okay. Not a tragedy. Okay, so um, this is where we started off last time, or where we, closely where we finished last time. We talked about uh, we talked about topology optimization and the importance of load paths, and then we talked about um, about using bigger bigger picture of load paths, like using the uh, using the engine as a stress member. And I mentioned this, and we're so excited in the, in the '60s, the late '60s, when Lotus used the engine as a structural member, and that, that actually wasn't anything new that they've been using it on farm equipment for uh, for decades before then. So it's kind of interesting. Um, we talked about Ducatis, Ferraris. We talked about the, uh, the electric scooter here from uh, from BMW. I don't think we talked about this, and I wanted to talk about this first before we moved in as part of the load paths. And I guess I should, um, if you guys can see it okay here, I'm going to scribble a little bit on the board. Um, so um, it's one thing to know what your, um, what your load paths are. It's another thing to transfer the load efficiently between, between members, okay? So um, I'm gonna draw on the board here so you guys can see this. Um, so suppose you have two structural members coming together in a right angle, okay? This is, this is pretty, Ubiquitous. You see kind of these combinations of structural members like this all the time. So, um, guys, can you see the board at all or no? Yeah, we can see it. Yeah, it's clearing up now. Yeah. Okay, good. Anyway, um, so you have two structural members coming together like this, right? And you want to transfer load between these structural members. But the problem is, is that if it's not stiff in the directions where it's touching, you sort of have this point load going in there. And the structural members just sort of strain out of the way, and you haven't really transferred load very efficiently. So, um, so, so that's the kind of situation here. So you can imagine, like, if this if this was your your two structural members coming together, is this, for example, is this structural member pushed upwards, and then this one react to that load? Um, you can imagine that this would sort of kind of do one of these, right? And that's not going to be very stiff when you've got that displacement like that, right? So, so the way that to, to solve this problem is you put in what are called the six shear panels. And then, so one, two, three, four, then five, six, so top and bottom. Okay, and that's, that's what I drew here. You can see them labeled up there, one, two, three, four, five, six. Now this is, um, this is an ideal state, and this is very, this isn't so common. Like you don't see a lot of structures where they actually do this, but it's, it's difficult to do, right? Because there's so many different, pieces in there. And I think, um, you know, if you, if you took a lot of the, uh, if you took a look at a lot of the pickup trucks that are out there, you know, these big pickup trucks like a Ram and a Ford F-150 and all those, you know, those, those guys. So they have, they have these ladder frames, you know, where there's, there's these structural members that kind of go like this along the whole length of the vehicle. Kind of looks like a python as well or something. Um, They have these structural members that go in between. And like, you know, here might be the wheels. These are ladder frames, okay? And they have these cross members that go through. And the way that they do these joints is typically not so not so beautiful. So what they do is they, 
if you were to take that cross section through, um, let's say through uh, here. Okay, that will look something like, a lot of times it'll look something like, uh, uh, something like this. Then I'll spot here and here. Okay, so maybe you guys can see this. Um, those spot well through here. Okay, so here you've got this is this is the cross section through through one of these four structural members here, right? And um, the question is, is how what's the what's a cheap way to most a cheap way to get to the highest bank for the buck in terms of efficiency of these cross members? And the way that they'll do that is to move to a cross section here, call this one B. One way to do that is to put a tube in through here. This is a this is just a hollow tube. Right. That's one way. That's one cheap way to go about doing this. That sometimes, well, this gives you this gives you a big increase increase in, in efficiency compared to just if you just did something really cheap like um, you know you could do something. Like Something like this, where you just took a tube and you kicked up a flange and then you just it there, right? So this is this is maybe the way they would do it, would have done it back in the 90s or the 80s. And then more recently they started doing it this way because it's a much more efficient joint for not that much more money, right? All we have to do then is just put a just put a TIG well or a MIG well around the circumference of the tube where it meets the where it meets these two pieces here, these two parts of the of the rail. Well, okay. you back to like have that final wall with the the Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They'll they'll weld around here. So right. sometimes they'll, they'll, they'll stick this out just a little bit further, and then they'll put a they'll put a, a MIG weld around the circumference right. there. So next time next time you see like a like a port or John Water Chevrolet Chevrolet Silverado drive by, like sometimes you can see it like next to the rear wheel. You can see where they've done just this. So keep keep an eye out for this. This is a cheap way to do it, but but this is really the right way to do it. And um, you know how do you do that, right? So. I can tell you that when I was an engineer at Chrysler and I was doing working on structural optimization things, like I tried to figure out how could you do this with a stamping. And I sat there for like three days with pieces of paper and scissors, like folding. I never got there. I mean, I never got to anything that was was really was really usable. But um, I used to call it steel origami. So if you're bored someday, try it out. Let's see if you can come up with a solution how to do this by just thinking how you could shape one piece of paper. With only a couple of joints to get there. Um, the thing that, that is exciting is that 3D printing offers a way to do this pretty easily, right? If you could you could make a joint and then have these these steel parts sort of attached to it somehow. You could very easily have these these joints. But um, the main thing I want you to remember here is just that just because you have structural members, you have to be very careful how you attach them together. Because if you're if they're not supported internally, then you can lose a lot of stiffness. In that structural member, in that connection, right, where the two go together, and things can just strain out of the way whenever they want to. Okay. Now, uh, while we're talking about joints, I should also point out some of the materials issues associated with joints. So here's here are three types of joints that are used on bicycles, one of my favorite topics. And I just want to show you how this works. The, the top one there. We're talking a lot about bicycles today, by the way. The top joint is what was sort of standard technology from like the early you know, 1900s up through like the, you know, maybe like 2000, early, early 2000s. So you would have a, a steel tube and you would, um, you would insert a lug. You'd have a steel tube, here's a tube. We talk about actually double butting it for the material issues because you lose strength and heat. And then the, uh, you'd have an investment cast lug structure. Joint like this, and then you can just, it's really a cool process. If you heat this up a little bit, you know, maybe two, 300 degrees Fahrenheit, and then you take a little bit of brass, just just melt it, it'll suck right into that joint if, the, if it's tight enough. It's uh, called a braze joint, and it's they use this on plumbing a lot. So, this cap capillary action uh, will suck the, the hot braze in there. You can 
make this actually a really, really strong joint. Okay, but given what I just told you about joint efficiency, you guys see a problem with this? It doesn't transfer the load very well this way, right? Because there's nothing, there's no, there's no wall here supporting this, so you can get strained here. Right? So this is something to think about. In, in bicycles, typically there'll be a big, thick aluminum piece right here, which kind of adds some, some stiffness in, in this direction, but it's not perfect. Uh, another way that, that, um, that they make joints on bicycles, for example, is they do what's called fillet brazing, where they, they take a lot of brass and they get it you know, hot, they get the joint hot, and then they sort of sculpt this gigantic fillet between the tubes, like you see there. That's, um, that's not a, I don't know, I think it's heavy. Uh, I think it's strong because you reduce the stress concentration a lot because it's a big fillet. But at the same time, it's really hard to do. There's probably not that many people in the world who can do this. There's maybe a handful of craftsmen who can actually do this properly. And um, it's expensive. Um, TIG welding is, um, you know, tungsten was a tungsten in our inert gas welding. This is where you use a very fine little electrode and you touch on the surface and create a little arc and you melt the, you melt the filler material in there. And, um, yeah, there's some people who are really good at this. It's um, it's low cost because you don't have the lug. It's low weight because you don't have the lug. But the problem is, is you have a very deep, deep heat affected zone. And there's a big drop in strength because you've got this thing so hot. Because that's what that's what TIG welding does. This thing's really hot. So anyway, here's three types of joints um, that you should you should think about. You know, maybe I don't know. This isn't something they would necessarily use in like a production um, cars, like you know. Where you're making hundreds of thousands of these cars a year, it's just kind of too expensive to do this. They use a lot of spot welding. I have a question and, about this slide, Dr. Baskin. What's that? I have a question about that slide if you could go back. Yeah, what's up? The the tube and lug, is the lug like a doubler between the two bars that are getting or the two tubes that are getting made it together? When when you say doubler, if you mean does it increase the thickness, yes. Okay, so because in that view, you see it kind of wrap around at least that forward down bar. Yeah. This one Does here. that mean that the stress concentration is now lessened because you're taking advantage of that wraparound area instead of going through the walls, through the wall of the vertical tube to optimize the joint, you're still mm -hmm. getting some optimization because you're distributing that stress around the tube at least. So the, the okay, so you're right. The, the um the lug, as they call them, has a much more generous radius than you would get by just putting the tubes together. So in that sense, the stress right. concentration is, is dramatically reduced. Yes, you're right. And then, of course, there you have very high wall thickness because you've got the thickness of the tube plus the thickness of the lug. The lugs are, the lugs are typically, in these days, in nowadays, the lugs are typically made from investment casting. You guys, you guys know about that process? Oh, you know about investment casting? Anyone else? Investment casting is a process where you, you make the part out of wax first, and then you sort of soak it in this ceramic liquid stuff and the ceramic kind of builds up around it. And then you can uh, melt out the wax and then refill it with, uh, with the molten metal like aluminum or, or brass or um, you know stainless steel maybe. There, there's a lot of parts that get investment cast. But um, anyway, and then, and then it fills up the cavity. And it's, um, it's a way to do casting. Some got its pluses and minuses. We can talk about that some other time. But anyway, that's does that does that answer make sense? I think that was is that Sam or Ryan? Yes, no, it was me. Thank you. Okay, it was Sam. Sam, okay, good. Um, did we go over this slide last time? No. Okay, so um, we were talking a lot in this lecture about the concept of the of the design space, right? That you can have. Um, you know, dimensions of a part, wall thickness, tube length, tube diameter, whatever, whatever. And um, you can have millions of variables and, and you can have this design space, right? We talk about this, you know, when you have this design space and you try to find a, a place in the design space where you meet all your requirements for strength and stiffness at the minimal weight. And we talked about topology optimization, where we said that the way to find the, the, the best load paths through a given packaging volume, given a certain set of um, boundary conditions was to uh, calculate out the average aggregate strain energy, which calculate out the aggregate strain energy for the entire system. And then your design variable would be, would be density, right? And we said that, you know, be between zero and one, and the design space would be the size of the number of elements you had that you discretized your part with. 
and uh, anyway, and so so in that way you can you can iterate through a multi 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 dimensional design space. You know, it could be million by million, you know, by million of densities, right? And then you find the the places where the where the density, you know, the optimum density for each element. So so this type of approach, as we mentioned, also you know it works it works well for for, for finding the primary load paths through the structure. But there's also some other neat tricks you can play with it. So one of them is is thickness of elements. So you know, cars, typical cars you used to drive down the street are made out of sheet metal. And they're they're made out of these big sheets of metal and they stamp them in different shapes and then they spot weld them together. It's actually a very, I think, clever and efficient way to make make a primary structure for a, a product like a car. So this this tool called topometry optimization is a tool where the design variable becomes the thickness of each of those sheets. Okay, so you apply these different load conditions, and then the design space is the thickness of each sheet of every part of the structure. And then you can find the place where the um, the thickness. So you find the place where the thickness gives the highest the, the thickness for each uh, sheet gives you the the highest strength or highest stiffness for the structure. Um, it's a pretty cool tool. I've used this one. I've used this one very effectively, actually. So here's a story. When um when I was working at Chrysler, I um I was a body engineer for part of the time there, and I was we were working on the uh, on the Chrysler Sebring, kind of a medium sized you know four door sedan. It didn't sell very well, probably for good reason. Um, anyway, so the um, this car is stamped, it's made from a bunch of stampings that are spot welded together, and there's a group at Chrysler called the Body Core Group. And so the Body Core Group is responsible for sort of setting policy. You know, you'll use this type of steel, you'll use this thickness, you'll use this kind of architecture, you know, you'll use this coating so it doesn't rust. And then there's sort of individual design groups that are responsible for producing the individual bodies for you know, various cars, like a, a Ram pickup truck or a Dodge Viper or a, a minivan, whatever. And there came an edict from the, I was, I was in the core group. I was in, I'm sorry, I was in the, the, the lease group that was, was making the Sebring. And there came this edict from the body core group that we're gonna take a thousandth of an inch off of every panel on the Sebring and we're gonna save all this money. So just blame it, take a thousandth of an inch off everything and save all this money, go back to the steel company and sell them. We can make everything you're selling us a thousandth of an inch smaller and therefore you're gonna, you're gonna give us a big cost savings, right? Because, because we took this thousandth of an inch off. And, and in reality, it's just sort of a, it's kind of a game they play because every part has a thick, thickness tolerance anyway, which is a, you know, probably more than a thousandth of an inch. So I being an obnoxious little you know, release engineer, I said, oh, that's ridiculous. I said, this is a stupid idea. So we have, we have the tools, we have this topometry optimization tool. Why don't we go in there and run a topometry optimization given all the different loading conditions and find out what the optimum thickness of every panel is. So they said, okay, fine, Doc, go ahead. So we went ahead and we did that. And we were able to take thousands, multiple thousandths of an inch off nearly every panel with the exception of a couple that had to be thickened actually. But at the end of the day, we saved $9 million over the, over the program um, compared to what they would have done if they just taken a thousandth of an inch off of every panel. So remember, remember this because someday you might be working at a company and somebody who doesn't know much about engineering is going to say something like this, you know, do this crazy thing. You say, oh, no, no, wait a second. We can, we have the tools, we have the computers, we have the algorithms. Let's do something better than that. And sometimes you can become a hero for doing that because um, there's real money to be saved when you can make things lighter. And, and companies trying to earn a profit, they tend to like that sort of thing. So now here's something to think about. Um, another cool, another tool is called topography optimization. And this is a tool where you can um, adjust bead structures on parts. So if you have just a flat panel and it's subject to any kind of loading, it's not very stiff. It's natural frequency is very low. It's gonna make noise. It's not gonna be stiff enough. So a lot of times it, an easy way to solve that problem is to stamp beads and ribs into the part. And a lot of times that's just done on an intuitive basis and it works okay. But this is a tool that can actually put some science behind it and tell an engineer this is where you should put your beads. This is how deep they should be. This is how long they should be. So the way, the way that this tool works is that you, you have a, a part, and this is a, a rear wheelhouse part. You have a part and you apply what are called these perturbation vectors. I think we might talk about this. Things called perturbation vectors. 
to the nodes of the mesh. And the design variable becomes how far you displace those nodes. So as many nodes as you have, that's the many design variables you have. That's the size of your design space. The optimizer will then go through and move all these nodes around to find the place where the aggregate strand energy is the lowest. And that gives you the stiffest part. So this is a pretty neat tool. Um, a similar tool is called uh, shape optimization. Unfortunately, they haven't found a T name, a name that starts with a T for that. But, but anyway, this is, this is similar. This is if you have like a tube, okay? And you mesh that tube or that structural member, and then you start applying these perturbation vectors to each of the nodes on this tube. And then the optimizer then dis displaces each of those nodes. That's your design variable. So depending on how many nodes you have, that's how many design variables you have. And you can, the, the optimizer will go through and start tweaking the cross-sectional shape of those tubes to give you um, the, the lightest shape that will meet your design requirements. So it's kind of, there's a, there's a good study, um, good report um, done once by uh, the American Iron Steel Institute where they, they paid a, a company called ETA in Detroit to, to work through this on, on um, rocker panels and tunnel structures and things like that. But you can, you can kind of imagine if you have a, if you have this tube, And it, you know, it's discretized into all these elements. Pilots are interested in this. You think about, you know, how can you apply these, these perturbation vectors? All these things, okay? Call this some um, one or A, B, C, D, E, blah, blah, blah. And you can displace these guys. You can kind of think of how this, you know, this might go. Might displace a little bit. One might go in and out, but you effectively you um, you're moving these things around. And then the optimizer, like I said, will figure out where's the, the, the best place to, to deform that so you get the stiffest structure. Another tool that uses a similar theme is for composite material specifically. This is um, fiber fly orientation optimization. So you know that carbon fiber, fiberglass, whatever, the um, the material is stiffest parallel, stiffest when you load the, the fibers in tension. Right, so it's stiffest, it's stiffest in, in this direction, right? Uh, parallel to the fibers. So when you have complex loading, sometimes you need to, to you can't just say, okay, well, we put the fibers in the direction of the load because there's too many load cases. So what this what this will do is it'll it'll determine the orientation of each of the plies to give you the stiffest structure given the loading conditions. And the design variable is the angle of the fly with, with respect to some baseline orientation. Um, there are this tool is used all over the place in Formula One. You know, because Formula Ones are made out of carbon, the, the, you know, the carbon fiber structure in the center of the vehicle. They have carbon fiber everywhere. There's, I think there's very little metallic, you know, structure on Formula One. And the loading cases are somewhat complex. So there's there's this tool that you that the Formula One teams to use to figure out the orientation of every piece of carbon fiber that they use to make up the structures, you know, whether those are primary structure or secondary structure. Um, a lot of times there is a, sort of a patchwork, like a quilt of fiber pieces, right? These little composite pieces. And you know, they're laying these things up in all these different directions. And so, so not only do you now have, you know, uh, one laminate and you're trying to find out the orientation of the different flies, but you have a, a whole patchwork over a whole structure where you're trying to find the orientation, right? So that becomes much more complex because now you have you have that many more design variables. So it's impossible to do it intuitively. And that's where the computer models can really shine. Just wait, before you go to the slide. Yep. For the like, shape optimization, yes. how feasible is that to actually like, implement using optimizer? Like, but I can just imagine having a tube. Like, you can easily make a tube, but how would you actually do those things? All right, on a, real on a real structure. Yeah. That's a very appropriate question. So the, um, if you just start up with the tube and you don't have a lot of money, you're kind of toast. There's not much you can do about it. The way, if you have lots of money and you can afford expensive tooling, the way that they do this is they use what's called hydroforming. So hydroform, you know hydroforming? Yeah. You have a mold and then you stick the tube in there and then you have pressurize it with water and it expands to fill the mold. So hydroforming is a good way to do this. Um, if you are making your part out of two stamp pieces, you can stamp them and then follow them together. 
or roll them together, or whatever. Right. So, so that's another way you can you can realize this structure from from a shape optimization result. Three D printing is another good option. All of a sudden, right? That's kind of new. Um, it depends how much time you want to fiddle with it. So the the uh, for example, like the aluminum frame rails in the Corvette, um, the previous generation Corvette, not the current one, not the mid engine one, but the front engine one, the C seven, I think. Those are hydroformed, and they and they, I don't know for sure, but if I had a guess, I would say I'm sure they use some type of shape optimization tool like this in order to form the shape of those tubes along every cross section. Um, carbon fiber is another good way to do this, right? Because carbon fiber has got all kinds of design flexibility because um, you can make the mold whatever shape you want. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, this is a this is a uh, a wheelhouse from an SUV at Chrysler. So this is the this is the thing that goes over the rear wheel, okay? And um, there was a problem during the production during the development of this particular SUV where they were getting a lot of resonant frequencies off of this wheelhouse and it's making all kinds of noise, which would drive customer bananas. So we went ahead in there and we used the shape optimization, we used a topography optimization tool to determine the bead structure. And at the end of the day, we were able to increase the natural frequency of, the, of, this, um, of this component so that it was far above any road input or dog way, you know, barking in the back seat or anything. So it, um, you know, we were able to get the frequency to bark beyond anything that would excite it. So we were able to reduce the noise. Here's a, um, here's another uh, SUV from Chrysler. They had some issues with uh, what's called matchboxing. So matchboxing of the, of the lift gate open, you know where the lift gate opens up? So, so it's supposed to, uh, you know, here's your lift gate looking from the back of the car, right? And under certain frequencies, you know, things hit these natural modes, right? It was doing something where it was going like this. I mean, I'm, I'm just, you know, I've exaggerated that, but there was this called matchboxing. And the, um, this certain road frequencies were, were exciting this, this mode and it was turning into a lot of noise and problems and leakage and stuff. So we went in there and we did a topometry optimization on the thickness of all the panels that were all, the, um, all those little sheets that were making up the, uh, the opening. And it worked. And we, of course, it had increased the weight by 6.2 kilograms, but we upped the natural frequency enough so that there was no problem. Shape optimization. Here is a, um, a carbon fiber bicycle frame. And so I, I often say that the, the, the modern carbon fiber bicycle frame is the most highly optimized structure from a, from a materials perspective and from a, a geometry perspective of any consumer product you could buy. And I think that might be correct. So, Here's this bicycle frame. It's, the whole thing is made out of carbon fiber. It's made out of many multiple plies and pieces. It's a, it's a patchwork. There might be 300 pieces of carbon fiber that are separately cut out to make this, right? And they're all they're all oriented in, in certain directions. I, I have friends who used to work at Trek, and they told me that yeah, we use shape optimizer, we use fiber ply optimization. Um, it's it's sort of the standard technology now, I think, in the bicycle industry. If you're if you're a high end manufacturer to go through and do this, if you have the amount of money to buy the optimizers and hire the people who know how to use them, you can do it. And you know you can take incredible weight out of bicycles. I mean, when I was, you know, I was telling people in the in the mid '80s, if you could get a 21 pound bicycle, you were probably an Olympian because they were really expensive. Um, but now we can really get bikes down to 16 pounds, no problem. And that's because of carbon fiber and shape optimization and fiber ply uh, angle orientation optimization. But the thing that's interesting is you go through this bicycle frame and you look at the cross sections of every tube and it's not the same anywhere. Every tube varies continuously as you go down the length of the tube. There's no two cross sections that are the same. And it's, it's pretty clear to me that they've gone in there and they, they use these optimization tools with the perturbation vectors like shape optimization. And they've, they very carefully tune and shape them, the cross section of every one of these tubes to provide the maximum stiffness at the lowest weight. And you know, here's a here's another example. This is a giant, and you can you know, if you, if you had this bike in front of you, you can see that you know this is square, this is square, but it's square. It's, it's like a rectangle, but it's in a different direction. And then the, the C tube doesn't just go like it's not just a tube that goes comes down. It actually comes down and flares out. You know, to take the load down here where the cranks are. Um, you know, same thing for the top tube, which has a lot to do with the bicycle handles. 
The C tube, I think, is probably more of an arrow thing. I think that's that's put into an airfoil shape to to um, more efficiently, uh, you know, cut to the wind. You feel um, anyway. Pretty neat stuff. Okay. Um, any questions about these optimization tools? Anything from you guys in the peanut gallery back there? No. Um, I want you to remember these tools, right? Because there's a you'll as you go through your career, you start seeing people making things. You'll see a lot of ways that, that these tools are like indispensable. They can do incredible things to reduce weight, increase stiffness, change natural frequencies. Um, really, really useful tools. Uh, it's these tools are now used pervasively in the automotive industry, and I, and I think on the high end of the bicycle industry, they're used all over the place. Um, I'm sure they're using them in aerospace too. The um, yeah, do you guys have any access to that software here? You know, like I'm not sure. You don't think so? We might, but I don't. Is anyone is anyone online or anyone here involved like the Formula SAE team? I know the first semester I taught this, there was a woman who, who used to wear her MIT SAE, you know, Formula SAE team shirt. Uh, anyway, that, they they could probably benefit from a tool like this. Um, I think the second semester I taught this class, there was a guy who worked at um, Lawrence Livermore Lab, and he was, they were doing something with fusion or something, and they were using this laser, big powerful laser. The laser was on this gigantic boom structure, and it, it, they needed to, I think, raise the natural frequency as high as they could. For some reason, I can't remember. And so they, they I guess natural frequency is not just a function of stiffness. It's a function of weight, too. Like if you have low weight, high stiffness, the natural frequency goes up. Goes up. If you have just high, high stiffness, I guess the natural frequency can go up, but maybe not as quickly. But if you can lower the mass, I think it goes up a lot quicker. So they actually went ahead and used this, this tool to redesign that boom. And I don't know whatever happened to it. I lost track of touch with the guy, but, but anyway, so someone really used this that actually wasn't even automotive industry, but. Dr. Okay. Baskin? Yes. Uh, I just thought you might find it interesting. We had to think about natural frequency a lot when working with cruise ships. Um, so when you're designing anything on the cruise ships, like all of the vibrations from, from the, um, from the motors travel everywhere. So oh, yeah. I forget if it was Carnival or Princess or which one had a giant chandelier vibrate itself to death. Oh, really? I, don't, I, th I think it was before the whole boat was released. So I'm not sure anyone was on board, but it's, it's become a really big deal with, with all of their stuff. So the engines are turbines or they're, or they're reciprocating these ones? I'm, I'm not sure. I just know that they vibrate things and, and you have to pay attention to different levels of vibration depending on where your element is within the ship, like how close it is to the engines. Okay. So this, so, you know, natural frequency and things vibrating, it's a, it's a very relevant topic. It comes up all kinds of places you don't think of, like washing machines are like one, one example of where you can get in trouble with natural frequencies. Um, bridges, uh, you know, they used to, they used to have this, when they have soldiers, you know, long ago, like when Napoleon was around, they had these soldiers marching in formation over some bridge and it collapsed. And so that, so they, you know, a lot of times soldiers are told to break up their, their steps when they go over a bridge so they don't get the natural frequency of the bridge that they're, you know, they're marching. Um, you know, rotating things like this, like Robin just said with the cruise ship, like that's a great example. So, and if you have a chandelier falling on a customer, that's a really bad scenario, right? So, um, you know, as an engineer, you're responsible for thinking about these things, right? And, and kind of keep in mind, if things go wrong, and these tools can really bail you out when you're in trouble. And there's a good chance your boss never heard of them, so you look like a really smart person by bringing it up. Okay. Okay. Um, next thing I'm going to talk about is sort of type of construction. The, um, as I think I mentioned on day one, one of the first um, discussions on lightweight was with balloons. So back in the, I don't know, 1700s or 1800s, like hot air balloons became a big deal and people were trying to set records for how high they could go up. You know, it's really interesting because they could go up high enough where you could like not have an oxygen, enough oxygen and die. Um, and they didn't have very good oxygen. I don't know if they had ox supplemental oxygen supply back then. But um, so the, the, the challenge was to take the gondola underneath the balloon and make it as light as possible because that would be one of the limiting factors that would determine how far you could go, how far up you could go. 
So I think those were the really the early pioneers of light weighting. Um, I've, I've looked in the literature several times, and this is the oldest paper I can find. If anyone finds anything older, let me know. But this, this, is, from, this is from 1904. And you can go online, you can pull this paper up, and I, I can send it to you if you're interested. You can read it. It's, it's difficult to read because the language is a little, I think, not in sync with the way we speak today. But, but um, so this guy, this guy, Mitchell, what's his name? Um, Michael, he, um, or Michelle? Yeah. Michelle, yeah. He, he was um, studying this, this idea of structural optimization and how do we make things lighter? And his analysis said that the way to make the light structures is to have an infinite number of really small tubes. So you have one thing, you know, one load case, one load applied here, one load applied here and there and there. And then to have the infinite number of tiny little tubes or, or little structural members that would link together to distribute the load. His, his analysis, and he calls it like, instead of structural optimization, he calls it economy. His, his solution was to use all these tiny little tubes and weld them together. And um, there's all kinds of interesting drawings in the paper where he's talking about loading cases, and structures, and packaging volumes, effectively, and how he would fill up that space with all these tiny little trusses of little tiny pieces that were hooked together. And um, interestingly, there's a, there's a Maserati that came out in the 60s as a racing car called the Tupo 61, birth cage Maserati. They called it a birch cage because it had, it had a fine lattice work of tubes to make up what they called space frame. And they were so small and so tight that they said, if you put a bird in there, it would get lost. So they called it a bird cage. But um, you can see the, so here's what this car looks like. And then here's, here's what the space frame that underlies all the fire with an engine and interior. But this is what it looks like. And you can see this very fine, this very, very, very fine um, little tubes that are welded together. Tiny little tubes that are welded together. Millions of little tubes that are welded together. There's probably thousands of pieces in there. And this actually came at a time when they were starting to play with, with monocoques, which we've discussed before, where you have like big sheets of material that take up uh, the structure. And um, apparently Maserati didn't have the money to do that. So they, they went this approach up instead, which I can hardly believe is any cheaper, but who knows. Um, any case, so um, this, is, this is one way to go about this. And I can tell you, like, I, I'll bring in one next time. So for fun, sometimes I'll, I'll get plastic tubes and I'll start gluing them together with, 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 you know, like crazy glue or whatever. And I'll try to, you know, if I can get a good drawing, I'll try to, I'll try to duplicate one of these frames. I'll bring one in next week. And um, it's surprisingly interesting what you learn from doing that. Because, because if you look at this and you kind of shake your head, you go, yeah, okay, great. I see a bunch of tubes. But when you actually have to build them and put it together, you start seeing all kinds of other interesting things about how the tubes are put together and how they react loads that, must have been fed into the chassis somehow. So um, anyway, it's interesting stuff. Um, but the point, the reason I bring this up is because I think this approach where they use all these tiny little tubes and welded them together, it came pretty close to what uh, Michelle was talking about, you know, back in 1904. So I like to think of this in terms of a spectrum. Okay, on one side, you have a, a true space frame here, like that first gate Maserati. And um, these are a bunch of individual members from a strict definition, the tubes of a space frame are supposed to be able to articulate with respect to one another. So they're supposed to be on swivel joints, what we call it. And because of that, the tubes never see a bending load or the structural member never sees a bending load. A pure space frame is, is only, the tubes see only tensile or compressive stress. All right, so NASA actually uses a lot of these things. NASA's made a lot of structures, like the lunar lander was a, was a space frame. And the, I guess when you don't have a lot of computing power and you don't have good fine and element analysis, like they didn't have in the 60s when they designed the lunar lander, um, this, is, this is one way to go about solving that problem is if you don't have any torques on the joints because there's, there's no, the joints are free to articulate, it becomes an easier calculation. So that's a true space frame. On the other end of the spectrum is a true monocoque, which is some French word. I think it means like single skin or something. Um, somebody could look that up. I don't have that right, but think of an egg. Like an egg is a true monocoque. Okay, so this means that the, the skin is stressed. The, in theory, the load can get distributed through all that surface area there, all that surface material. And that's, that's an efficient way to react loads. Okay, so 
Then there's the area in between, which is where most real structures exist. So a cockroach, a cockroach is almost like a monocoque, right? They have this exoskeleton, it's kind of these big, big panels, so to speak, right? Um, they're, they're kind of a monocoque. I think they're closer to the monocoque, it's interesting. And then you look at us, you know, we're, you got, you got bones and stuff, and we're, we're not really a space frame, right? Because the bone, although they do articulate a little bit, sometimes they're not straight, they're bent, right? Like these ribs. And therefore they take some bending away. So they're not exactly a pure, uh, a pure space frame either because the structural members see something other than a tensile or a compressive load. And it's, you know, it's far complex. I mean, our loading condition is kind of weird, right? Because we, we move around and stuff, right? We're not just static the way a bicycle frame or, or car chassis is. So I want to play a little game with you guys. Here we have six structures. And we're going to go through and we're going to, we're going to guess what's a monocoque and what's a space frame. So the first one here is a Bucky Dome from Buckminster Fuller. And would you call this a space frame or a monocoque? Spring Guys, you can, you can talk online too. So space frame, agreed, okay. The next we have this very early wooden airplane. Um, space frame or monocoque? We used to call them semi monocoques. Semi monocoques. There you go. I like yeah. that. Semi monocoque. Okay, it's close to monocoque. Next next semester, I'm going to make that semi semi monocoque for you, Sam. Okay. Wonderful. Here's a here's one of Elon Musk's SpaceX rockets. These are sort of these aluminum pieces that are kind of stacked up and put together and they hold fuel and the fuel tries to expand, it's under pressure. Base frame or monocoque? Monocoque because it uses the pressure vessel as the structure? Exactly. Okay, here we have this Lamborghini Aventador made out of carbon fiber pieces, really expensive. Space frame. I'd say it's somewhere in between. I'd say it's in between because because the tubes are the structural members see something other than a pure tensile or compressive load. They see some bending and some torsion. Therefore, I would say somewhere in between. So it's truss bridge, base frame. Okay, the bicycle frame. Base frame. What? Base frame as well. Um, I would call it somewhere in between. Okay. You call it in between. And and this is this is something I want I want you guys to think about a little bit is that you know this is not like this is not like the truss over here, it's not like the bridge, it's not like the Buckminster Fuller dome. Um, it has all these big gentle radii between the tubes, right? And the tubes can't articulate with respect to one another. They certainly see torsion loads and bending loads. So so this is really somewhere in between. And um, I wonder, I don't, you know, this is the thing, like you ask people like, what's better, a space frame or a monocoque? And you'll, you know, as many people as you ask will get a different, it's the same number of answers. So and this is something that, that I've given a lot of thought to. What's better, what's more structurally efficient, space frame or a monocoque? So if you had, you know, all the money in the world to make a car or, or an airplane or, a, you know, whatever, like which one of these things would you do? And prob probably, honestly, for the given structure, it's probably different for each one. And certainly you would, you'd be hard pressed to make a, a rocket um, two out of a space frame, but um, space space frames. Okay, so space frames are good because there's not a lot of material and they're very light. Um, they're good at reacting point loads at the nodes between you know tubes where they join. Uh, monocoques are good because they spread the load out over lots of material. Okay, but the problem with the monocoque is they don't take a very good point load, right? So if you you know this is the whole thing with the egg drop competition. You've been, you guys have probably seen that, right? When you drop the egg off the building and whoever can get the egg to survive wins the competition, right? So um, eggs don't take good, very good point loads, although they're, they really are a pure monica. So um, which one of these is better, you know, for a car or a bicycle or an airplane um, or a truck? And um, I think the topology optimization result that I've shown here, I showed you this guy's a couple lectures back, but this, this in my mind tells me that there's somewhere in between that's probably the best, maybe even more towards the space frame side of things. Because if you look at where the optimizer has distributed the density within this packaging volume, 
it's clearly a bunch of sort of discrete structural methods. It's not, it's not a monocoque. It's not, there's not enough stress in the quarter panel or the parts of the rocker panel or the hood or, or the, the front tenders that would make sense to, it would make sense that a monocoque would always work. And so this is, this is something I think about that like if you, if you design these things as a monocoque, you probably have superfluous material and extra weight. So you look at Formula One cars, they have this carbon fiber center monocoque, right? Maybe you've seen them. I should probably have pictures of them, but I don't. Um, and they, you know, they are very, 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 very stiff. They are, I can tell you, they're like two to three times stiffer in torsion than your, your average like passenger car, your average, you know, Toyota Camry or Honda Civic or Honda Accord. They're about two to three times stiffer than those cars. And I had a, I have, I have a friend who used to be a composites engineer at McLaren and then he worked on Formula One cars. And he, and he, he you know, I said to him, Juan, his name is Juan. I said, Juan, isn't this kind of you know, ridiculous? If you have all this extra capability, you can't possibly be using it, but it's weighing you down. And he said, yeah, I know. We, we played with, with some things that look closer to bicycles and they weren't as stiff and the drivers didn't like them. Apparently they didn't, they didn't react as well. So we went back to the pure Monica. But, but the thing about it is, is that you start talking about passenger cars and trucks and airplanes and, and things that have a greater responsibility, let's say, to the environment than Formula One car. But a Formula One car has got to work well for about an hour and a half, and that's about all you got to worry about. After that, you can you know, throw it away and get a new one um, or sell it to some rich guy. Um, so, so when you talk about passenger cars and the need for lightness over you know, extreme handling capability, and all of a sudden, you can say, okay, maybe there's these lighter solutions, the space frame, maybe it's a better idea. Maybe this is more responsible for the world because if the vehicle is lighter, it's not spewing as many greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. So because of this, I think that there's some, that probably there's something closer to a space frame that might make more sense for passenger cars. And really these panels like the roof and the floor pans and the, and the fenders, uh, the rear quarter panel, you know, the trunk lid, they're really there to keep wind and water out. And they're really there to make the vehicle look a certain way. Okay, that's important, I get it. But at the end of the day, they're not there for structure. So you don't need high strength steel. You don't need carbon fiber. You don't need high strength aluminum for roof cap because, because you just have mechanical capability that you aren't doing anything with and it's weighing you down. So because of that, I, I sometimes think that the better way to go is the, is the space frame approach. And, and the auto industry, I think, should really start thinking about how can they how can they get closer to this? How can they find something lighter to keep wind and water out? You know, the smart car, if you guys remember that, the little tiny two-door thing that, that Daimler made, that car was, was kind of clever that it, it sort of was a space frame. And then to keep wind and water out, they had this really lightweight um, sort of uh, PPO, um, polyolefin uh, thermoplastic, thermoplastic uh, polyolefin to keep the wind and water out. So they're, they're kind of expensive because oil is expensive, right? But, and they're made of oil. But, but the point is that they don't have much mechanical capability, but they have enough to keep wind and water out and maybe, you know, the occasional beer bottle that's from a car or something. But, but they're not weighing the car down either. So I, I really like that solution. I, I, I would, it would, I think it would be good if the automotive industry could look more into that type of approach, which they have, and they, they probably will continue to. But um, the, the stamp steel monocoque, which is kind of closer to what we have today, I think has superfluous capability. And I think there's still a way to be taken out of it. So anyway, apparently we're out of time. Um, next week, we're going to go through bicycles. Uh, we, we don't have lecture next week. So the week after next, we're going to go through um, the history of bicycle frames, um, the, different, the different materials that were used with time and how it changed and how they went from more of a space frame to a monocoque approach. And um, there's a couple slides on that. And we talk about the relationship between styling and what they do in the product design office and how the vehicle looks and how that affects styling. And then our last lecture will be just a kind of a example of several different vehicles that were cars that have been made over the years and the kind of monocoque versus space frame materials, all the different things that they used in order to come to lightweight solutions. Any questions, guys? Great. So uh, next week I'm probably bringing, or not after Thanksgiving, I'm probably bringing models and things with me. So if anyone wants to come to class, don't feel in touch. That's the time to do it.
I have a personal question for you, Dr. Baskin. Did you say you worked on the E-Class Mercedes? Um, I, did I work on the E-Class? I worked on the E-Class and then I worked in the factory when they were building them, but I didn't work on any okay. engineering. See, see how yeah, I, I was in I've, the factory when they were building it. I worked on the, um, I worked on the Dodge uh, Chal uh, Charger, Challenger, Magnum, and the Chrysler 300. And those cars were, in a very real way, copies of the E-Class Mercedes at that time. Okay. I'm considering a newer E-Class, so I thought I'd ask your opinion of it. It's, it's an excellent car. You know, it's not going to be, mm -hmm. um, it's not an inexpensive car. No. You, you know, you have to, um, you have to keep up with all the oil changes and you got to change yeah. the brake fluid once a year and you got to change the radiator fluid every other year. And in a former life, I was an ASC certified mechanic before I was an oh. aircraft mechanic. So okay. I, 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 res I respect the uh, preventative maintenance. Yeah, I think Mercedes are, are wonderful cars if you're willing to do the maintenance. If you're not, then you'll probably end up hating the car. <laughs> I think that could be said for any car, yeah. No, I don't think so. Maybe, I, more, I think maybe more so with Mercedes, yeah. Yeah, I, I think that um, from people I've known who've had Toyotas, like basically like change the tires, change the brake pads, fill it up with gas. That's it. Yeah. That's all you got to do for like 300,000 miles. The uh, new AMG 53 that they're putting out is actually going to be a hybrid as well, but it's the kind of hybrid where they put uh, magnets on the end of the flywheel, basically. Oh, yeah. So kind of a, a, a mild hybrid is 